Have you been thinking about the tulip? <laughs> and what are your thoughts so far about the tulip? Excuse me? That you can trip over. Yes. But actually, sometimes I wonder how, we tr how others really trip over it. But I did, so. Um, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. These are the five points of Calvinism. This is not what we believe. Uh, f from time to time, you will have someone ask you the question, are you a Calvinist or an, are you an Arminian? And you'll say, no. <laughs> I, I am neither. But particularly, we are not Calvinists. We don't subscribe to any points. Uh, I know even in some gray circles I've been to, you'll hear the debates about, well, I'm a two-point Calvinist or I'm a three-point Calvinist. Uh, you know, it, it's like it's a shopping list uh, that they choose from. But we looked at total depravity, which states that the lost are completely unredeemable. God created them as vessels fit for destruction. And they are, I guess they exist as a contrast to his goodness. But under that, we, we find that man without a knowledge of God will never come to this knowledge without God's making him alive through Christ. That's one of the first things. Man's totally depraved and he's incapable of being saved. They're unredeemable. That's the reason that I call them the unman, because the Bible says it's God's will that all men be saved, but obviously if you're predestinated to be one of the vessels fit for a destruction, you're not a man. You can't be a man, because then you would be a part of God's will, but you're excluded from God's will because you're not. Uh, unconditional election. States that... Election, consequently redemption, is completely of God, and the only critical element is his choice for whatever reason that he chooses. He doesn't have to have one. He's just chosen. We've looked at that. Uh, of course, it states there that uh, God chose those to whom he pleased to, to bring to a knowledge of himself. So the only people that can know God are the ones that he's unconditionally elected. And those that are the lost people cannot be saved. They cannot have a knowledge of God. Of course, we, again, we looked at the scriptures and we see, you know, Romans chapter 1, talking about people that are as lost as you can get. It said when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Can a lost person know God? The scriptures say he can. So we've looked at total depravity, unconditional election. Last week we were talking about limited atonement. That states that Christ died for the elect only. He did not die for all mankind, nor did he die for the lost. Um, we've pretty much looked at those particular passages of scripture. Uh, John 17 Verse 9, it says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. So they're, they're, they gather from that that God is not concerned with the world, but only for the elect. Uh, as if the only ones that were given were the elect. Were there others given? If the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about those that were given him, who, who was given to him? What I hear? Yeah. This, how about the disciples? He often talks about those as being the ones that are given to him. Again, context is everything. Uh, Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Again, in the Calvinist view, that many is who? The elect. Of course, we understand because we read the scriptures dispensationally when he was talking about the many. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Excuse me? The little flock or the whole nation? 
Well, he died for the nation. I mean, and if you go back and, and, and you read, uh, I think we looked in Isaiah and, and some of the other passages, he uses that term many, you know. Uh, but it, it's given in that particular context. And of course, that also fits in with the Jew first program, you know, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, you know. The, under the kingdom program, the Hebrew program, could a Gentile be saved? No. Yes, he yes. could. Oh, if he became a if, Exactly. Uh, now, yeah. are you saying that, that the Calvinists thought that the disciples were Calvinists? No. No, that's not what I said. Did they think about it? They didn't. No. Uh, I, I'm can't, I can't even process that right now. Sorry, Sherry. Okay. Um, no, the, the, they were given as his disciples. The passages speaking of disciples, they take out of context, and instead of looking at it as him talking about the disciples, he's talk, they think he's talking about the elect. Just like this passage said, he, gave, he shed his blood for many. The many must be the elect. There can't be any other group of people that qualify there to be the many other than the elect. In other words, they've taken and pulled that one verse out of its context. And Could that, I'm asking a question now. Could that be many in God's way of looking at it because he knew who was going to believe? And, and many was going to believe, but there were so many that wasn't going to to believe. He died for all, but only some of them is going to believe. So he died for many, the ones that were going to believe. Exactly, but in the, in the Hebrew context, he died for the nation. Prophetically speaking, he died for Israel. When you go back in the Old Testament, he died for them. He gave himself a ransom for them. So there's many of them, but they certainly aren't all. And they had to believe. Faith is always faith. And that's one of the, the, the things that seem to get overlooked, I think, sometimes uh, by Calvinists. Although Calvinists, they would say that faith is, is necessary in, a, in every period of time. But they would say that only the elect can have faith. And obviously, an unsaved person cannot because he's unregenerate. He does not have the life of God. God will not quicken him. He is a vessel fit for destruction and cannot know God, cannot respond to the gospel, and cannot be saved. But uh, in this particular uh, sense, we're in Matthew, uh, it's, it's um, in the context of the prophetical many. Not, not who's going to be justified and who's not going to be justified. Also keep, in, keep this in mind, and I've mentioned this before, this is a dispensational understanding. Most people don't, most people in religion don't get this. When we talk about a person being saved, we're talking about justification, correct? Because that's the way Paul uses the term. We're justified, we're redeemed. Justification. In the context of the Gospels in the Old Testament, you will not find justification as a separate thought or idea unto itself. In other words, when uh, Zachariah stood there and prophesied being full of the Holy Ghost, he said, you know, he's raised up an horn of salvation in the house of David and so forth. When they talked about salvation, they saw it as their kingdom hope, they saw it as victory over their... Uh, uh, persecutors and, and, and enemies they uh, in the Old Testament context saw it as rain for their crops and, and fruitfulness and, and their possession of the land and basically receiving everything that God promised them in, in that program, that kingdom program. So they didn't see justification apart from that. They saw justification as a part of the whole package. So when you see verses that deal with salvation or that people use for salvation in, in the Gospels, it's not going to be referring to justification as such because they didn't understand that in the prophetical context. 
Um, limited atonement. Christ died only for the elect. He did not die for all mankind. Again, we, we rest on 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4, or chapter 2 and verse 4. Who will have all men to be what? Say. You know, God either means what he means or, or, or he doesn't, you know. <laughs> God cannot lie. God cannot die. And God tells us over and over again that, 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 he, can't, uh, that he can't lie. John 6.37 said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Uh, Again, how does that teach that Christ only died for the elect? It doesn't, you know. So, again, these are verses that need to be looked at um, in their particular context. In some cases, talking prophetically about the nation of Israel. And the Gospels, a lot of times, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's talking about those that are given to him, he's talking about his, his disciples. So... That changes what you get from the passage of Scripture. But choice has always been a foundation uh, in every period of time in dispensation. God, how many Gospels are there in the Bible? Anybody know? I, I don't even remember the total count, but there's a, there's a bunch. I mean, in, in Galatians, it's, you know, it talk, he, right, uh, Paul says... Uh, that the scriptures preach the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. The scripture preached the gospel unto Abraham, saying, What would the good news be? And thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That doesn't say anything about the cross, doesn't say anything about the coming Messiah, doesn't say anything about the shed blood of Christ, and so forth. Well, what was the essential element in, in that between Abraham and God? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. righteousness. Faith has always been the basis of salvation. It doesn't mean that God, in every period of time, is dealing with man in the same way. Things change. He told Noah to build an ark. He told Moses to go to the top of, of Mount Ararat, you know, Mount, Ararat, Mount, Mount Sinai. Uh, and these, these men obeyed that, but they had to have faith and confidence in, in, in what God was doing at that particular time. Um, what's God doing today? What's it called? He's doing grace. <laughs> so the good news today has to do with grace. And it's, it's, it's uh, entirely different than in time past. Irresistible grace states... That salvation is by God's grace. However, since God's election is the only criteria, his grace is only offered to the elect, regardless of man's choice. That's their stated doctrine. That is their stated doctrine. Now, as I said, I, I went to one of their sites where they explain that. So let's, let's read... A Calvinist explaining what they mean by irresistible grace. The result of God's irresistible grace is the certain response by the elect to the inward call of the Holy Spirit when the outward call is given by the evangelist or minister of the Word of God. Okay, does that make sense? It's the, it, it, it's the certain response. What does that mean? That means that the elect, when they hear the gospel, will be saved. They don't really have a choice. The choice, God made the choice. Therefore, it is irresistible. Christ himself teaches that all whom God has elected will come to a knowledge of him. Their proof text is John 6, 37. When we looked at that, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. 
Men come to Christ in salvation when the Father calls them, John 6, 44. And the very Spirit of God leads God's beloved to repentance, Romans 8, 14. You notice how they skip around and cherry pick their verses? What a comfort it is to know that the gospel of Christ will penetrate our hard, sinful hearts and wondrously save us through the gracious inward call of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Um, how does that sound? You look puzzled, Maria. Doesn't make, well, no, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Well, there's no choice in any of that. No. Again, and that, and that comes back down to it. And where is the sadness that these so-called elect people have about the other people walking around that they love? Well, see, that's just it. That, that's the paradox under Calvinism, and nobody knows who the elect is, and nobody knows who the vessels fit for destruction are. You have no idea. So, I mean, you, you could give birth to a vessel fit for destruction, and that's your beloved child, and that, per, that beloved child could never be offered salvation, could never know God, and can never be saved. But the elect think that they know. Well, actually, you'll find that the elect or in just as much doubt, in fact, more, more doubt than anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. They're idiots. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no way that the elect is ever told, you are the elect. But they're thinking, and yet they're not thinking. Well, they're thinking based upon a doctrine that they know, but they don't really know. And basically it comes back, it, they don't really know, and basically it comes down to a feeling. They feel like they're the elect. And if they're in doubt, then, then they don't know what to do with that, because how do you confirm then that, that you are the elect? Right. So there's really no reason for us to do anything. Not at all. Yes, Joel. Um, had I been raised in uh, um, this do uh, Calvinist doctrine about election, you know, there was that period when I had fallen away from the Lord, and had I been sitting at a bar and drinking, and I, and I had been raised up in this elect doctrine, I would have probably thought to myself, you know, clearly I'm not one of the elect, because clearly my behavior shows that uh, I wasn't meant to be one of the elect. But, you know, because I was rooted in grace doctrine and Paul's letters, you know, mm -hmm. I knew that the Lord was never going to give me up, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I knew about eternal security. I failed right. him, but he never right. failed me. Well, see, so, to the Calvinists, they say that's where, the doubt, that's where we're going, because we're, we're <laughs> what comes after irresistible grace? Perseverance of the saints. And that, what Joel is saying and sharing speaks right to the heart of that. But uh, is, is man able to resist the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So where in the world would anyone get the idea that you can't? Because that's the point of Calvinism. The work of the Holy Spirit in man is irresistible. Well, Would that that were actually true? yes. Acts 7.51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Yeah, All right, so he's, here's Stephen standing there saying, 
You are resisting the Holy Ghost. Well, again, I come back to the question, who's resisting the Holy Ghost? The elect or the unelect? <laughs> oh, why wouldn't anybody ask that question? I mean, if it's the elect, if it's irresistible, how can they resist it? Okay, and if they're the unelect, well, of course they're going to resist it. They can't do anything else because they can't believe it, right? So how does the doctrine fit the passages of Scripture if you take and you look at the principle? You know, of course, God's will can be resisted. I mean, how else could God even be just? If God made people resist, how could he then punish them for functioning in the manner in which he created them? Would that make sense? I mean, that's not the kind of God that I, that I want to, you know... No, they don't. That's the point. They will claim that they do, but they do not. Um, you can do spite to the spirit of grace, Hebrews 10.29, of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. How does that fit the doctrine? It doesn't. Again, I, I look at the past. Are these, these folks elect or are they unmen? Which, which ones are they? Uh, if they were unmen, why did the Holy Spirit even deal with them to start with? Okay. Yeah, yeah, well. Uh, God does not make men resist. He creates man with a will that can either acquiesce or resist. And we make that particular choice. Uh, Romans 9, 19 and 20. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Yeah. In light of all yeah. Can man say, why did you make me this way? Yes. Absolutely he can. It might not be logical, but we can. Now, would he be speaking in the physical sense? If, let's say he was born um, cerebral policy. Would he be speaking physically or... Are you, did you make well, first of all, God did not make anybody. Um, but he could say that. Or he could be talking. Well, again, people, yes, again, and, and people born with physical deformities or, or, or ailments and things of this nature, most of them are plagued with the question, why did God make me like this? He didn't. Sin caused that. Exactly. Is this. We live in a sin-cursed creation, and, and those are the consequences of that. God did not choose anybody individually to make them ill. Your child dies. God did not pick your child and kill your child. Uh, God doesn't do that. So. If he chose the twelve, yes. what do they do with Judas? Excuse me? What do they do with Judas? What does who do with Judas? With the Calvinists. I don't know if they'd do anything with him. <laughs> I, I, you know, yeah, exactly. If God chose him, yeah. what did they do with Judas? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, they would say that he was chosen, and he and he fulfilled his his particular function. Yeah, yeah. But so he didn't have free will. He God told him to do what he did. Well, in essence, yes. Perseverance of the saints. Now, this is generally the one that most Calvinists cling to because they'll say this means the security of the believer. Obviously, you must believe in perseverance of the saints. But the problem is that's not what Calvinism means by perseverance of the saints. It states that the elect will persevere. 
problem with that, if a person falls or departs from the faith, obviously they were never one of God's elect. Consequently, what Joel proposed about, about his particular experience. So, so many of them get saved and unsaved? Yes. Saved and unsaved. Well, no, it's not saved and unsaved. If you fall, you weren't saved. You weren't one of the elect. See? And, and so, and, and that, <laughs> that, that confuses things even more because, again, we've got two groups of people, the elect, and you've got the vessels fitted for destruction. So, if you didn't persevere, that means you were not one of the elect. Well, that means you had to be one of the vessels of destruction. Well, why would God fix it so that you think that you could believe the gospel and be one of the elect and then somehow find out through your lack of performance that, oh, no, I guess I was mistaken. Now, that really sounds like a good program, doesn't it? I mean, that really demonstrates the grace of God, doesn't it? This is, this not, is not today's program. No. Well, it's not any program. No. It's, not, it's not a question of today's program. It's not a program for any period of time. It is a system of theology that is cultish in nature, and it is heresy. Mm -hmm. It's a tool of Satan. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, of course, again, we were working. We started to study out of Romans chapter 8 because of what they do with Romans 8, 28 through... 33, and again, reading those passages, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. So, again, the conclusion from that, it's been predetermined that the elect will persevere. That is their conclusion. Their description is perseverance of the saints is a doctrine which states that the saints, those whom God has saved, will remain in God's hand until they are glorified and brought to abide with him in heaven. Romans 8, 28 through 39 It makes it clear that when a person truly has been regenerated by God, he will remain in God's stead. You notice, truly regenerated by God. Well, what other regeneration would there be? The work of sanctification, what God has brought about in his elect, will continue until it reaches its fulfillment in eternal life, Philippians 1, 6. Christ assures the elect that he will not lose them and that they will be glorified at the last day, John 6, 39. The Calvinist stands upon the word of God and trusts in Christ's promise that he will perfectly fulfill the will of the Father in saving all the elect. So it's predetermined that man will persevere. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means our performance is predetermined. As well, there's no will involved. And that's interesting because Paul continually appeals to people to do something. Well, again, what would the point be if there were no choice? If, if God is performing it and we don't really have a choice, then you, you can't justify all of that in, in your thinking. Uh, John 6, 39, and this is the Father's will that which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Again, pre predetermined performance. No will is involved. Where the doubt comes into the Calvinist, and, and I've heard this particular, Sarah, I won't mention names, but people of note, where they're passing from this life to the 
eternity was recorded, many, in many instances, those that were Calvinist in nature, some would be Methodist, some would be Presbyterian, you know, dep depending on the particular religion, they would be in angst at the moment of their death and praying fervently that they really and sincerely were one of God's elect. Which in and of itself doesn't make much sense because if, you, if you're not one of God's elect, no amount of prayer and, and wishing and hoping is going to make it so. Uh, it's just... Uh, yeah. The, the thing about perseverance of the saints, it's not about the perseverance of the saints. It's God that does the persevering. <laughs> not us. And just as there's nothing that we can do to be saved other than to believe, there's nothing that we can do to remain saved. <coughs> eternal security is a product of salvation, right? Again, Sherry, when does eternal life begin? Minute. That's right. Paul said, uh, well, does Paul give us the idea that believers' faith can be overthrown? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. He says, it's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He goes on to say in verse 19 of the same chapter, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal of the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If someone departs from the faith, is there any way that we're going to, is there any way that you would know that that person is saved or lost? No. Can a person deny the faith? Mm -hmm. Yes. And still be saved? Yes. Right. We would know, but God does. And, and Paul makes that, I think he makes it pretty clear. Uh, even that those that resist the Spirit and are taken captive by Satan at Satan's will can recover themselves. You know the passage that I'm talking about, 2 Timothy chapter 2, you know. We're supposed to, in meekness, we're supposed to instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And we've often made that statement. We can't recover anyone. They have to recover themselves. But they can be recovered. And he's writing to believers. He's talking about believers. So, in that particular, are they the elect? Yes, they are. We looked at election. It, election, there is election. God does choose. He chooses those that believe. His, his election is conditional. He chooses those that believe. And can someone chosen to believe lose their faith and depart from the faith? Paul deals with the, with the question. So obviously they can. So again, if somebody's departing from the faith, I mean, there's only two classifications under the Calvinist system that could be. It could either be the, the vessel fit for destruction, who wasn't saved to start with, or it's someone that's genuinely elect, and they can depart. Our security lies in Christ. It doesn't lie in our performance. Amen. If, if, if my security was found in my perseverance, uh, I should have given up a long time ago. No, you should have believed that Christ would have given you up, but you don't. No. You knew that all along. Yeah. Well. So there we have total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement. Irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Anybody want to buy into that system? No. 
a good Berean is not going to have a problem with, with Calvinism. Because as a dispensational Bible student, you're going to go to the verses that the Calvinists use and you're going to re re realize that it's contrary to our belief system because, number one, they, they've got the context wrong. They don't understand the different programs of God. They only see the covenants and, and one unified program all the way through history. Uh, they don't see chosen nations. They see chosen individuals. They don't see different agencies as such. They don't see the difference between the nation of Israel and the church, the body of Christ. Yes, Benny? Well, again, Calvinism is a heresy. Many times people that are caught up in the heresy don't realize that they're heretics. And uh, when you shed light on things that, that bring to light that they are in error, uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to receive. Uh, Mm -hmm. And everyone that you know love your entire life right. is misstepped. Mm -hmm. That is very yeah. unsettling. Well, you know, this is true. I, I've noticed that a lot of people become extremely angry and frustrated <laughs> having escaped the system because they don't understand how their friends and loved ones can't. And... Sometimes we become very unbecoming in our behavior and manner in dealing with them because we are so frustrated that they can't see what they're caught up into. And uh, all we can do is go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, and, you know, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, meek, instructing. And that's, that's all we can do. Um, you, can, you can't yank them out of there, but as we look at heresies like this, heresy plays a vital role in, the spirit, in, in spiritual growth. Did you know that? You ever thought about that? Paul, our apostle, in the dispensation of the grace of God, he, he reminds you, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you. He said, there must be that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. What verse is that? 1 Corinthians yeah. chapter 11 and verse 19. Heresy is a, is a motivation to study and to confirm the doctrine. I mean, isn't that what Acts 17 11 is all about? About being a Berean? You know, they search the scriptures daily to see what? That these things were so. And so, that's, that's what Bereans do. Um, I've often said I wish I had a magic wand and I could just make Calvinism disappear off the face of the earth. I think it's, I think it's the worst scourge theologically. It's bled into every single denomination and belief system and, and, and it has people's thinkings warped. And most people that think and the Calvinistic framework don't even realize that they're doing it. They're completely and totally unaware. Um, the theology can be refuted, you know. Uh, we've looked at some of that. But it will still continue to haunt the halls of churches because those churches, in many cases, have turned their backs on dispensational truth and right division because the answers to the passages of Scripture on Calvinism are dispensational. Our understanding of those passages comes from rightly dividing the word of truth. But they are so steeped in, in the traditions of men and, and the dogma of their religion. You know, isn't that interesting? 
You know, doctrine's called dogma. It's called dogma. D-O-G-M-A. Well, there's enough. You ever heard the word dogmatic? Well, does dogmatic mean truth? No. No, dogmatic means there's no, no bending. There's no, no flexibility, no nothing. And, and people in religion are dogmatic, even when they don't know what they're being dogmatic about. But they, you know, my, my daddy was a Baptist, and my granddaddy was a Baptist, and, you know, I'll die a Baptist. I mean, I've had that said to me I don't know how many times. I came out of a Baptist background. Man has a free will. We are a free moral agent. We're not predestinated to glory or dishonor at our birth. The promise and the hope of the believer belongs to those that hear and receive and believe the gospel. We are baptized into the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's where our security comes from. That's where our perseverance comes from. Not that we persevere, because we won't, but God will in everything that he has promised us. Eternal life is a free gift to all who will by faith put their trust in the finished work at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. That's the good news that we proclaim today. Christ paid for all sin, for all men, for all time, some 2,000 years ago. And a soul today can know for sure where they will spend eternity if they will simply choose to believe the gospel of grace. Paul said he feared for the Corinthians that, you know, that they would depart from the simplicity that is in Christ. God didn't make salvation complicated. And he, he, it, we certainly don't need five points of a theological system that pro prompts centuries of debate in order to explain the simplicity of the offer of salvation. Uh, anyone that would require that would be because of the motivations of man. Not from the, dis not from the purpose and the intent of God who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Father, we thank you for your finished work and the Son of your, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you again for our life in him, our security in him, our completeness in him. That once placed in your Son, we are in a spot from which we could never escape. We thank you for the gift of eternal life that we share with one another and for the fellowship that we have. In the name of your Son, and we pray in his precious name, amen.